This is More Than Work, the podcast reminding you that your self-worth is made up of more than your job title. Each week, I'll talk to a guest about how they discovered that for themselves. You'll hear about what they did, what they're doing, and who they are. I'm your host, Rabia. I work in IT, perform stand-up comedy, write, volunteer, and, of course, podcast. Thank you for listening. Here we go. Hey everyone, thanks for being here again this week, or if it's your first time, thanks for joining for the first time. Got a new episode up for you. It's with Doug Knoll. He's a peacemaker. He's a lawyer turned peacemaker. So you'll learn what that means, but it's pretty cool. What I like about this chat is that Doug goes from a, a career of over 20 years to a brand new career because he realized he needed to serve people. And that's, I've just had a couple of guests recently that have inspired me so much because I'm kind of thinking about what I'm doing in my life pretty much all the time. And I also want this podcast to serve a purpose. And one reason I created this podcast was for the purpose of helping other people. And one way I'm trying to do that is by telling, having other people tell their stories and just give their insights. And then hopefully people listening get something from that. And so with Doug, what I really liked was how the change happened over time, because a lot of times we'll hear about, oh, someone's the best at this or someone's running this successful business or they're doing this degree and they're finishing, but you don't hear about the evolution of that and how long it took them to get there and what they're doing to do that. And I have a few people like that coming up, but Doug Knoll, who I'm talking to on this one, just, uh, he's pretty cool. We had a lot of laughs, but we talked about some very serious subjects and he had a really intense job before and he's doing, I would say pretty intense work now, but in a different way. So I really like that. I also, he's someone who talked about how COVID impacted what he was doing and how they've had to pivot or change. I know people don't like the word pivot. It's office speak, right? But sometimes we pivot. So he did. And I just really liked how he talked about how they evolved and changed what they were doing in order to meet the needs of people still, even though COVID happened. Um, so those are the two main things that, but this one's so important because at the end, just a few things he says, and he just keeps saying these really profound things that kind of resonate with me when I was editing the podcast. Um, otherwise just some news for me, cause you won't hear me talking about going to, uh, the public leadership credential program at Harvard Kennedy, because I finished my last course. So I have a two week project coming up in a couple of weeks and then I'll be done and I'll officially have my public leadership credential and I guess be qualified in both moral leadership and public policy, though I won't write policy for a while. So I will leave this brief. Enjoy the episode. Please let me know what you think. I'd love to hear from you. And um, let's do this. Hey everyone, my guest today is Douglas E. Knoll. He's a lawyer turned peacemaker, so we're going to hear what that means. Thanks for being a guest. Hey, thanks for <laughs> so. having me. California to London, I can't mind that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we're both we're both Californians. That's right. You're, you've stayed there. I'm here for now, but we'll see. So, uh, speaking of, you are in California. What part of California are you in? I live in rural California, about 80 miles south of Yosemite National Park. I have 10 acres in the central Sierra Nevada. I'm in the center of the state, about halfway between LA and San Francisco. It's about three and a half hours to each city from where I live. I think some people will hear that and they're, if they're not in California or from California, they think, well, it's three and a half hours to another country in my case. Or two. <laughs> <laughs> three and a half hours, nothing in California. <laughs> yeah. You don't, I mean, you, you don't even think I had, it. no, I had a nightmare one time going from San Diego to LA. And I mean, it took twice that just to get that distance. Because the five gets so jammed up. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And we did that Californians thing already where we talk about the five. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. And, you know, here, you know, here, the roads are really good. Actually, the roads up here are a lot better than they are in Southern California. I was just down in Corona Del Mar a week ago, and mm -hmm. I couldn't believe how bad the freeways were. The road conditions were horrible. So. Yeah, it is horrible down there. I was talking to a friend about that, too, about just the road works and like, by the time they get done fixing a stretch of highway, they have to go back to the front of that stretch exactly. and start over again. Exactly. Exactly. So first of all, let's just talk about you being a lawyer and in your legal career. 
because that's where you started out. So you were on the corporate side of things. Well, I, I graduated from high school in Southern California and then went back east to Dartmouth College and graduated with a degree in English. And then in those days, if you weren't going to med school, you went to law school. Mm. <laughs> so that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. Came back to California, entered law school in 74, graduated with honors, law review, all that stuff. So I did well academically and had a choice of a number of jobs. And I chose to move to Central California and clerk for a, an appellate judge for a year, which was a great experience. And then after that, I joined a medium-sized bankruptcy and civil litigation firm. And they, they hired me to groom me to be a big-time trial lawyer. And in fact, they did, because I joined the firm in September of 1978 and tried my first jury trial in November of 1978. My second trial started in December of 1978 in the Southern District of California, which is the federal court in San Diego. It was a seven and a half month securities fraud case. And we were defending a farmer in a securities fraud case. We won that one too. So that's how my career started. And for the next 22 years, I was a hardcore trial. I tried over 250 cases of all different kinds wow. of complexity, um, all civil, no criminal, no divorce or personal injury. It was all large commercial business types of cases. Interesting work. And I made a lot of money, but my heart wasn't in it. So what happened was that I started studying the martial arts in the 80s and eventually got my second degree black belt. And my teacher huh. fired me. <laughs> he said, you're too arrogant. You're too much of an asshole. <laughs> you're going to hurt somebody. Go learn Tai Chi. <laughs> and so I did. And I studied Tai Chi as a martial art. And it turns out that one, Tai Chi is the oldest of all martial arts. And second, it is extremely vicious. Every blow is a killing blow in Tai Chi, once you understand it as an art. But Tai Chi has two interesting paradoxes. The first is the softer you are, the stronger you are. And the second is the more vulnerable you are, the more powerful you are. Soft to be strong, vulnerable to be powerful. Did not compute. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, as yeah. a hardcore trialer, a secondary black belt, fly helicopters and airplanes. I mean, I had to do all kinds of crazy stuff. And so that whole paradox really didn't, I didn't understand it, but it sunk into me until one day, some years later, I was in the courtroom in the late nineties. And the thought came to me, what the heck am I doing in here? And after that, after that, I went on a river trip, whitewater trip with a bunch of friends and spent the week in my raft thinking about how many people I served as a trial lawyer and concluded that I hadn't served very many at all and said, I'm not doing this anymore. But I didn't know what I was going to do. And if, the universe provides, right? So I come back mm -hmm. from that trip and I'm driving down out of the mountains to my office and I hear what turned out to be one and only public service announcement for a new master's degree in peacemaking and conflict studies offered at Fresno Pacific University. So I signed up, I enrolled, and for the next three years, I was a full-time master's degree student, and this is in my late 40s, full-time master's degree student, full-time trial lawyer, and three-quarters time law professor. And that was the end of my first marriage. <laughs> <laughs> so I had long discussions with my partners about what I wanted to do with all this new knowledge I was acquiring, and, and we could not come to agreement. And so one day I just, I gave a week's notice and walked out, left $10 million on the table and just walked out of the law firm and started my own peacemaking practice. And that's how it started. And that's when my life really started. I was 50 years old and wow. it was amazing. Huh? Yeah. So there's a lot there. I mean, just kind of, it's like, you've got the story down succinctly, but there's a lot. It was a journey. <laughs> yeah. So first of all, just with thinking back about your initial career of, I guess it was over 20 years as a trial lawyer. Did you like it at first or were there things you liked about it that kind of started to fall away as you got older and just started to reflect on your life? I love being in the courtroom. Doing trials is fun mm -hmm. if you're prepared, but you know, we don't try really try that many cases when you think about it. And what I really enjoyed the intellectual challenge of puzzling out the problem and then thinking about how am I going to present this to a judge and jury in a way that they're going to understand it? Because usually it was pretty complex. And then thinking about what, what's the likely outcome. So I really enjoyed the strategic thinking. The preparation was incredibly hard and long and tedious. You know, uh, for every hour you spend in a courtroom, you spend at least eight hours preparing for, for that hour. And that's just mm -hmm. pre-trial, but after you've done all the pre-trial and discovery stuff. 
What I didn't like, what finally got to me, was that it was constant conflict. Mm. You're fighting with your partners over compensation. You're fighting, of course, you're always fighting the opposition. You're fighting the judge. You know, you're fighting your own client to get paid. I mean, it was just a constant, constant fight. And that just wore me out. And I just didn't like that constant adversary process. And, you know, it, it wore me down and I wasn't burned out. But I also felt that I wasn't really living to my true calling. It mm. took me that long to grow into the idea of becoming a peacemaker, lawyer turned peacemaker. I couldn't have done it right out of law school. Mm. But, you know, so it was just it was, you know, an evolution in my consciousness and in my, you know, my growth that led me to that. Yeah. And then when you got to asking yourself the question of how many people am I serving? Right. Do you feel like it took a while to come to that question versus other questions? Like you were maybe thinking about different aspects of what your purpose was, but did it, well, did that question come up first or what? Yeah. Well, well, like I said, I was in the, it, it kind of started, you know, obviously this has all been churning around inside of me and I sure. haven't really been giving a lot of thought to it, but then I had that question that popped into my head when I was cross-examining somebody in the courtroom, what the heck am I doing in here? Hmm. And that really stuck with me so that when we started the trip, I knew I was going to have 10 days on the main salmon up in northern Idaho. I was a former whitewater guide. So with, with a bunch of friends, we're all ex-pros and all have our own gear. And, you know, so for us, it's nothing. And so I got to spend the week or 10 days just floating down this beautiful river thinking about what the heck am I doing here? And then that led to the question, well, how many people, because I'm you know, analytical, how many people have I really served? How many people came into the legal system and left better off than they were when they came in? And I could only count five people that I'd served over 22 years that I felt like their situation improved as a result of the work that I did. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's a really crummy you know, assessment of what most people would consider to be a very successful trial career. And sure. I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to go another 30 years and say, maybe I've only served 10 or 15 people in 30 years. That's BS. I need to do something yeah. else. I need to, I need to help people in a bigger way. And, and, you know, the beauty of it is that I made the right choices because I served more people in a week than I served in 22 years. Yeah. As a trial lawyer. You've mentioned quite a few activities you do, but I think the predominant one that I heard was just the Tai Chi eventually after you got your right. second degree black belt. So do you feel like the practice of martial arts has been the most, I guess, the most important for you as far as like getting you to a place where you're now a peacemaker as far as your not work activities besides education? I mean, it, people yeah. do those all different activities for different reasons, but right. how do they play in for you? I so guess? it was a combination of things. I've always I've been in and out of spirituality, of different kinds of spirituality ever since mm -hmm. college. So interestingly, the martial arts for in the beginning for five or six years of just intense study of how to kill somebody, <laughs> how many ways can you <laughs> kill them with your hands, right? And that's basically what I learned. But in the Tai Chi, I had the opportunity to learn how to actually manipulate Chi, life force. And so mm -hmm. I would do things like blow out candles with my fingers and blow, blow business cards across the table just with Chi energy. Very cool. People, their eyes get as big as saucers, right? And that led me to getting interested in... I, I got introduced to a system of healing called pranic healing, which was created by a guy in the Philippines, Master Cho Kok Sui, has now since passed. And he created pranic healing and arhatic yoga. And that, that really appealed to me because it was he's an engineer. Chem, he was a chemical engineer and very analytical about his spiritual practice. And, and he just laid this out, this whole system out. I said, oh, I'll give this a try. And it turned out that I became a certified energy healer and I actually could mm -hmm. heal people. How about that? <laughs> you know, whoa, look what yeah. happened. And so all this was happening in the 90s. So I had the Tai Chi where I was learning to be soft and vulnerable. I was studying this spiritual practice called Arhatic Yoga and healing, serving people as a healer. And this is all completely opposite to my career as a trial lawyer. So at day, in, in, during the day, I was a hardcore trial lawyer. Yeah. And at night, I was a spiritual healer and practitioner and, you know, Tai Chi person. And I realized probably by the mid nineties that I was living, I was out of integrity. My life was out of integrity in the sense that I was living, living one life in contradiction to another life. And I said, mm. this just, this, this can't, this is unsustainable. And I think that's when it finally dawned on me in that trial that what am I doing in here? I don't need to do this anymore. 
Wow. And I think that's what kind of led to it. So it wasn't like a big flash of illumination or I had an enlightenment. Sure. This is something that happened over many, many, probably over two decades. Because I went into law, not really sure if I wanted to be a lawyer or not. It was kind of a default. Yeah. But, he, but eventually, you know, I came came around and, and saw that this was not serving me. This profession was not serving me. And that's when I left. Yeah. Well, and then with going back to school in your, I guess, later 40s by then, what was that experience like for you? Well, I've been teaching law for quite a while. I started teaching law in 86. So, so I'm an academic by nature, but it was really hard. Not, not because going back to school was hard, because as a lawyer, you know, we're constantly reading and studying all the time. So it wasn't that. It was that peacemaking and complex studies is multidisciplinary. And I had, the, I had some brilliant mentors and they pushed me. They knew how smart I was and they pushed me hard. And so I would be it's the first time in, since law school that I actually had to have a thesaurus and a, two different dictionaries as I was reading stuff. Because I'd be reading philosophy and I hadn't studied philosophy since college. And so and these philosophers were talking in gobbledygook. They sounded like lawyers. You know? mm-hmm. And then I'd, move over to, then I'd move over to theology because we did a lot of looking at the idea of peace and conflict and religion. And especially in the, in, in the context of Christianity. And, and of course, the truth is yeah. different than what most people think. But, but, but then the theologians have their own language. And then I would study sociology and then they had their language. And, and you know, yeah. so every single one of these disciplines has their own coded language to show the, everybody how smart they are. And they were <laughs> using five syllable words when they could have used one syllable words. And I was sitting there with the dictionary trying to, what the hell is that? I thought I was mm-hmm. a very smart guy. <laughs> and I, of course, then I drew the same conclusion that I finally realized as a lawyer in the beginning of law, I read a judicial opinion. I said, man, I must be really dumb. I don't understand this. And I finally realized, no, I'm really smart. It's the judge is stupid because the judge can't write clearly enough to make himself understood. And I drew the same conclusions from reading a lot of this other multidisciplinary stuff. Eventually I picked it up and figured it out. And, you know, I started thinking about it. and, And because I'm really good at integration and critical analysis, the way this program worked in those days, not anymore, was it was Oxford tutorial style. So at the beginning of a term, I'd go in to see my professor and he would say, this class is about, here's your reading list. This, let, let's take the nature of nonviolent revolution, which was one of my favorites. So he mm-hmm. said at the, our first session, he said, we're going to study the nature of nonviolent revolution. And the question you're going to answer at the end of the term is, from 1989 to 1993, Czechoslovakia, the Soviet Union, Germany, all these Eastern Bloc com- countries were able to move from an autocratic or semi-autocratic government to some form of democracy without violence. Yeah. But Northern Ireland and Yugoslavia failed. Why? And here's your reading. And each, each week you're going to study a different country, study the history of that country and what happened. And at the end of the semester and write a paper on the book that you read. So every week I had to write a paper and then present it. And so that's how you learn. And so yeah. I was reading all of these books about, what happened during that time period in the, in the history of all these different countries. And of course, in that, the answer to the question was, it's all about leadership. Yeah. And so, for example, the reason that you'll never find peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians is because the leaders are cowards. They're absolute cowards. They're afraid of peace. You've got Zelensky, who is obviously courageous. He's he's really grown in his role as the president. Yeah, it's amazing. And you've got Putin, who's a coward. Putin is a coward. And so you, they'll never find peace. Putin could never come to the table and negotiate. So, so that was the big lesson that in, in, in any kind of situation where you've got a group conflict, you have to have a leader who has the courage to find peace. Mm. So that was the kind of that was the kind of training I was getting. Looking at all these things, we looked at. Yeah. We looked at. I I studied under one professor who's the uh, leading scholar of the nature of violence and nonviolence in the Bible. And so we looked at the Old Testament and the New Testament and looked at the nature mm-hmm. of violence and looked at Jesus not as some mystical creature, but as a political figure. And why was he why was he murdered by the Pharisees? Mm-hmm. And it was a political it was a political murder. It didn't have anything to do with anything other than politics. And he was caught between the zealots, the Essenes and the Pharisees. And he was just a 30 year old rabbi preaching peace. He was radical. <laughs> he was a radical. If he were alive today, he would be in jail. He'd be in prison. And back then, you know, he got crucified because of his beliefs. So it's all very interesting stuff. 
That is interesting. And it's funny just you saying like you had to get out your dictionary and thesaurus and stuff oh, yeah. because man, when I started my class in January last year, and it was actually leadership, moral mm-hmm. leadership for right. the first two classes. So what you're saying is resonating a lot, actually. I seriously thought, wow, did I become dumb? <laughs> you know? I know. And and, and you, know, friend, I, you know, and I'm a smart guy, right? Or you're a smart yeah, woman. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm not, like maybe I, I don't know. I'm not, probably not as smart as you. Just we, we've had different paths, but I'm not, I know I'm not unable to read. And I was starting to question that. Like, can I even read? So I completely, I completely uh, no. understand. And, and then it's just, you get used to doing that again too. And, and. Oh yeah. Getting used to studying again. I mean, I'm 20 years out of school and not used to, you know, three unit courses, 2000 pages of reading and for the course. That's a lot of reading yeah. and dense reading. It's a lot of stuff that you can drink and drink a Chardonnay, have a glass of Chardonnay and no. cruise through this stuff. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely it's not going right. to happen. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. So, so, so you get through the the school and then you end up quitting your job. And how did you get into like the next steps, basically? Yeah. So one of the things so I started mediating, I'm a mediator as well as a peacemaker. And, but, but I did something different that a lot of people like me don't do. Most legal lawyer mediators only deal with litigated disputes because they just want to work with the lawyers. And I was more interested in because of my training and in, in working in broader conflicts. So I started I would do litigated disputes, but I also worked in conflicts that were not in litigation, such as family business conflicts or organizational conflicts of all different kinds. And. I started getting called into all these really high emotion cases, and I began to realize that all conflict is all conflict is emotional, and all conflict is caused by the mismanagement of strong emotions. My problem was that I had not been trained. Nobody knew how to calm an angry person. I was taught this old active listening stuff, uh, which was developed by Thomas Gordon back in the 1950s, and it, it doesn't work. And then Marshall Rosenberg stole his stuff. They both were at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And Rosenberg basically stole his stuff and rebranded it as nonviolent communication. That didn't work either. I took all those courses. So I was stuck. And I had, in my master's degree, I had started studying neuroscience, which is long before Mm -hmm. anybody had ever heard of neuroscience. This is 1998, 97, 98. And I mean, functional magnetic resonance imaging had only been around for three or four years. So, but I, but I was lucky to get tutored by a professor at Caltech, John Allman, who started teaching me how the brain works. And mm-hmm. I came to two insights. One, everything starts in the brain. So we ought to understand how our brain processes information. And two, we're 98% emotional and only 2% rational. So I've been studying and studying and studying and studying, really trying to figure out how do I deal with these angry people? And one day in 2005, I was called into a mediation in Santa Barbara, California, where this divorce couple had sued the husband, ex-husband had sued the ex-wife for a, eight, it was an $18,000 problem. They spent $50,000 each in attorney's fees. Oh my God. <laughs> kind of classic. Yeah. And when I came into the conference room, you know, met them, they were well-dressed, well-presented, looked like normal upper middle-class people. And they started screaming at each other. I mean, if there had been knives on the table, there would have been blood on the floor. And I just sat there and said, what am I going to do? And the thought came to me out of the blue, listen to the emotions. So that's what I did. I quieted them down. I do my Moses parting of the sea kind of thing and get, get, get them sit down and quiet. And, and then I had John start telling his story and, what I had Susan do is instead of trying to reflect backwards, paraphrase what he was saying, I had her say, I had, I asked her, tell us what he's feeling. She couldn't do it, but then she got it. And she said, he's really angry. He's frustrated, whatever. And so John would tell his story. I'd stop him. What's he feeling? And within five minutes, everything, the whole temperature in the room completely calmed down. And she went from being victimized to feeling empowered. So I got through John's story. We flipped the roles. John told his story. She listened to his feelings or he listened to her feelings, all done. John puts his face in his hands like this and starts sobbing. Three or four minutes, racking sobs, honest to God, real grief. And he looks up at her and says, that's the first time you've listened to me in 25 years. Hmm. And they settled the case without me in five minutes, got up, walked out holding hands to have lunch with each other. And three hours before, there would have been blood on the floor. Yeah. What did I just do? So I know what I'd done. And so I said, ah, fluke. So I started using it in other mediations and it worked every time. Yeah. Okay. So then a study came out in 2007 out of UCLA. 
Matthew Lieberman's lab, and, who's a neuroscientist, and he did a scanning study to show why this process called affect labeling works. And now I have the science to show, my God, this is what's going on in the brain. And it's amazing how I won't go into the science of it all, but it, needless to say, this is empirically established through brain yeah. studies that, that when you label somebody's feelings to them using a use statement, it literally calms their brain down. And so then I started teaching it. I would go to conferences and teach other mediators and lawyers and judges how to do this. And I would get reports back being saying this stuff is amazing. Yeah. But I was still getting a lot of pushback on it. And so that's when 2010 finally rolled around, yeah. right at the end of the financial crisis. And I get a call from my colleague, Laurel Coffer, who was a mediator in Los Angeles. And she read me a letter that she had just received. She was standing in her mailbox, in fact, from a woman serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole in the largest, most violent women's prison in the world, which was at that time Valley State Prison for Women in Chowchilla, California, which is about an hour, hour and a half from where I live. And basically, this woman was asking the world if she would be willing to come into the prison and teach the lifers how to be peacemakers and mediators to stop the violence because they were tired of it. Mm. They weren't getting out. There was their community and they wanted they wanted peace and the guards weren't helping. They were making things worse. Yeah. So Laurel read a letter to me and said, what do you think? And I said, I think we should do this. if It's the real deal. So it was the real deal. And we got permission to start. And we started the program, the Prison of Peace Project, in April of 2010. And the foundational skill that we taught, and we to this day still teach, is how to listen to emotions called affect labeling. And that, and that's, we teach a whole bunch of other skills too, because we're taking incarcerated people and through a very intense one-year training process to become a peacemaker and a mediator. And then if they want to become trainers, it's another th three years on top of that. But the program has been phenomenal. Pre-pandemic, we were in 15 California prisons, 12 prisons in Greece. Uh, we have a startups in Italy and in Kenya. Wow. And the pandemic, of course, shut everything down. But we continue to do distance learning. And this last year, we, we had $500,000 and we put the entire curriculum on film. So it's in post-production right now, so that probably in another couple of months, we will be able to offer Prison of Peace anywhere in the world, subtitled in any language. It's amazing. It is amazing. We've trained over 20,000 people in California. About three or 4,000 have been released. No reports of recidivism. Not one of our people is reoffended, to our knowledge. And it's just been an amazing program, Prison of Peace. Huh. Yeah, and it's just, I mean, it's a lot because I just... um just thinking about the people that you're serving now are people that in many ways are kind of pushed way aside by society. I mean, if we look at the idea that there's first of all, over incarceration in the U S and right. then, there is, and then, yeah. And I was careful when I said that just because I know that ends up being an issue that people don't always agree on, but, but there's that. And then, well, then you're taking it internationally too. But then also just it's people that are disregarded. And so this is who you're serving. And the fact that someone in prison asked, identified a need there and said, hey, we're sick of this. Because you're right. The people are there for life for whatever reason. That is where their life is now. And so it's yeah. kind of amazing. They wanted to improve their quality of life even in that situation. Right. You know. And we never expected to get it to grow as big as it has today. It's, I mean, we started with with the women at Valley State Prison for Women. Then the state decided to convert it to a men's prison. And in those days, it was all pro bono. It was just Laurel and I. We weren't getting any money. We yeah. paid for everything out of pocket. Basically gave up our professional practice to do this. And both of us almost went bankrupt. <laughs> uh, and, yeah. and then when it was repurposed to a men's prison, ultimately, we went back in and started training the men. And we found that the men were just as amenable to this as the women were. And then finally, we started getting some funding in 2017. And we've been able to grow since then. You know, the thing that, I, that I've learned about incarcerated people is they're there for a reason. And most of them have been horribly abused. And my observations have been that most people grew up in dysfunctional families, emotionally dysfunctional families. And are they go through this abuse of this thing I, it's called emotional invalidation. And it's the, it's the number one cause of emotional dysfunction and, and actually comorbidity later in life. And the people in prison are just worse. They just grew up in a worse environment. You know, right. I mean, and, and the stories that you hear about their upbringing, well, no wonder they're in prison. And I learned that we, murderers are not born, they're bred. They're bred by their parents to be murderers by their environment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, o only there for the grace of God 
are they and not you and me? Because mm -hmm. we all grow up in, in an environment that is emotionally, emotionally abusive. And every single, every single person I've ever talked to, once I start pointing out to them what the abuse is, they say, oh, my God, you're right. It's unnecessary, but this way of child rearing has been handed down from generation to generation, and we're just in this never-ending cycle. And in the really extreme cases is how we create criminals and people who kill and end up in prison as a result. Well, yeah, and even in the same household, you end up with people in different who process what they experienced in different ways, and it shows up in different ways. I mean, I can say things for me have shown up in a certain way that That's right. were different than my siblings, you know, and... And sometimes it's just the luck of DUIs are the thing I think of where I know I could have gotten a DUI for right. sure. And I'm not proud of it, but it's just something that especially anyone who started driving before Uber, but then I just didn't get pulled over and someone else did. Right. And then they have a record and I don't. There's a certain amount of luck involved in all of this. And There's a lot. Yeah. And, but the, but the, you know, the, the bigger question for me is, you know, is it possible that this emotional invalidation that I've been talking about? So you remember when you were a little girl and you're running around outside and you fall down and you skin your knee and you start to cry and maybe you're two or three years old. What are you told? Uh, you'll be fine. It doesn't hurt. Exactly. What, yeah. Like, what? You're it doesn't hurt. Yeah, it does. Big girls don't cry. That's emotionally <laughs> invalidating. That is the worst thing you can say to a child. It absolutely destroys the brain, the human brain. There's a study called the ACEs study, Adverse Childhood Studies out of San Diego. And it shows that that kind of emotional abuse, if it's consistent, and in most families it is, will lead to all kinds of comorbidity in terms of health problems later in life. It leads to diabetes. It leads to obesity. It leads to cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. You name any horrible disease that you can have in your 50s and 60s is all emotionally caused. It's not genetics. It's not environment. It's emotion. And Kaiser did the study because Kaiser's model, of course, is wellness. They want to keep people yeah. out of their own kids in their system. So they got really interested in what what's the relationship between early childhood experience and medical issues, health issues. And they were astounded at the results they got. If you get three ACEs, three adverse childhood experiences, you know, you're more likely to go to prison. You're more likely to be drug addicted or addicted to something. More likely to be divorced and have failed relationships. More likely to take up smoking. I mean, the odds are really stacked against you. So I started studying, well, how bad is it really? And it turns out it's really bad. Whenever you emotionally invalidate a child, you're basically shutting that child's emotions down. And what they need are parents who can coach them through their emotional moments, not shut down their emotions and tell them it doesn't hurt, you know, get up rub dirt in it, you know, the worst thing you can do. And, you know, as a result, we have a society that, of a lot of unhappy people. And and it's all, all in a continuum. On the worst side, we've got people in prison serving life sentences. And on the other side, we've got people that are functional, but really unhappy and, and deal with their dysfunctions in a lot of not so pleasant ways. Yeah, I can see that. And also, I think even just thinking about conflicts with people at work or just interpersonal relationships, right. a lot of times it does come down to them just not even acknowledging your feelings. I have one person right. who just continues to not acknowledge my feelings. So, so we always have conflict and I don't even want to talk to them anymore. And I wouldn't if I never had to again, right? It's someone I have to talk to, but it's like, and I've told them that and they just don't get it. But it's like, that's the core of the conflict. And that's a really good observation because it's the core of every conflict. Yeah, It's because we're not acknowledging each other's emotional experience. We're, we're refusing to listen to each other because we don't know how, really. It's ignorance mm -hmm. that conflict persists and escalates. And once you learn how to listen to and reflect another person's emotions, I call it listening another person into existence. Once you learn how to listen another person into existence, fights and arguments go away forever, forever. I'm My wife and I have never argued, never have a fight. And we're not passive aggressive people. We're both highly intelligent, highly educated people. And, and she's a spiritual counselor and practitioner. And I'm a peacemaker. And, you know, if one of us is upset, the other one just labels what's going on. It's amazing. Yeah. So with Prison of Peace, then you recorded, like you said, so you're going to be able to present it without right. actually being present. But then are you also now reengaging in person? And do you see a difference between those two? Well, that's a great question. 
prisons haven't opened up yet in California. COVID's mm-hmm. dropping, fortunately. So, and we have put in for a number of grants with the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation to test different ways of using the video curriculum to see which one's the most effective and in which population groups is it going to be most effective. So we don't know yet. And we also don't know whether it will be as effective as in-person training or we actually go in and do the training as opposed to them having, we'll train facilitators how to use the the videos and what how to do that. But they don't have to have the knowledge themselves. They don't have to have know the prison piece curriculum because it's all on video. They just have to be able to you know facilitate the, the classes, which is more effective. The, the videos, I mean, I've watched the whole thing. It's over 40 hours long and, you know, it can be, be delivered over probably a, a year. And it's spectacular. What we've done is amazing. I mean, first of all, aesthetically, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, we hired a full Hollywood film crew to do this and they did a fantastic job. So, but pedagogically, is it going to be as effective? We think so. We hope so. Right. The one thing we do know is that we've gotten inquiries from all over the world on how to bring prison of peace into v- various institutions. And and by delivering this in this format, we know that we'll be able to, even if it's not as effective as in-person training, it's going to be more effective than anything else. Yeah. So we will be able to reach prisons, reentry programs, and even domestic abuse shelters I mean, mm-hmm. people all over the world that can learn these foundational skills to bring peace into their lives. It's not just inmates. It's anybody who's got conflict can benefit mm-hmm. from learning these skills. That's really awesome. It'll be interesting to see what it does, too. And I think just, I mean, education in general has had this huge shift to, you know, hybrid or remote models anyways. And at least in California, the the uh, Department of Corrections is way, way behind on technology. But they finally got around to... Um, giving the incarcerated population tablets with the access is restricted. But but one of the things that can happen is that our program can be delivered on tablets and they can watch the videos and then go to class and, you know, learn, mm-hmm. you know, watch it again and practice and interact. And so we're hopeful that, you know, technology can really work in our favor here. And we'll see. Yeah, it's a, it's a big, huge experiment. And more importantly, we can deliver it overseas. You know, like like my colleagues in Kenya, you know, they they really wanted they really want prison of peace they're all set up for it their covid hit and it stopped it dead in its tracks but now we can deliver prison of peace via the film the curriculum on digital and i can train up their their people as facilitators in probably 10 or 15 hours of training and they're ready to go as opposed to hundreds of hours of training to, to be able to teach the material yourself and it's so scalable then and just taking exactly it. exactly yeah. right that's great so are you still doing private practice as well now that? Yes, I, well, I, I, do, I do a lot of things. I still take on mediations uh, and arbitrations where I work basically as a private judge. I also have online courses that I promote and teach. I'm teaching people these skills as much as I can. And I teach graduate classes at Pepperdine. So that keeps oh. me going. And, yeah, that's good. But then you, you did find what was at your course. So other than what you mentioned like tai chi and then you mentioned whitewater rafting so you're also a musician is that correct i am i picked up old time and irish fiddle in law school but last in the last 12 years i've taken up jazz and blues violin and i have a teacher in massachusetts and we meet every other monday for an hour and a half and i and for lessons and so i've been working on jazz violin it's very very difficult <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah. but it's really good because it's a completely different way of using my brain and I really enjoy it. And, it, you know, very, very challenging. You know, the the idea is to, you know, you listen to a, a common song, like a Broadway song. And now how do you improvise against those chord changes? Mm-hmm. How do you create beautiful music that's really interesting to listen to on a violin? <laughs> You know, which, <laughs> there are a million there are a million moving parts. <laughs> so if you miss if even one little thing is is off, it sounds horrible. So it takes yeah. exquisite control practice to manage it. So I play. So I do that. You know, I taught skiing. I'm a level three certified ski instructor and taught skiing for many many years. Now I I don't teach skiing, but I live close to skiing and less than an hour away and up the mountain. And so this time of year, although this winter has been pretty dry. I'm, yeah. able, I'm able to get out and go skiing once or twice a week. So that's kind of fun. And, you know, I'm just, I'm living a perfect life. 
I'm happily married and live in a beautiful place and make enough money to get by. I'm not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm comfortable and I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm very blessed. Oh, that's great. I mean, it sounds like you've you've achieved kind of through time. And I like the, for me, what, what I've gotten out, and sometimes I just like to say what I get out of it so people might think about it too, is just that it happened over time. It wasn't an overnight thing. And Correct. That you recognize that. So, because sometimes I think people get impatient and I'm a little bit younger than you, I'd say. So like, just based on when you started practicing, but I think my generation and then the one which is now finishing school, I guess, um, we're very impatient about how long things take, but it's really, you know, it took me 42 years to get where I am right now. So if it takes a five to get to the next thing, it shouldn't be that big of a problem, you know, cause it's, it takes time to know I yourself. Patience is really important in the, and the, the, there are very few overnight successful people. And mm -hmm. the, the secret to happiness is learning how to serve other people. It's not about the money. It's not about the big car. I've had all the money. I've had the big car, the big house, all that stuff. That's not what makes you happy. And in, in fact, a friend of my wife who lives in New York City is an actual executive assistant to billionaires. And she was here visiting a couple of weeks ago and we were talking and there are very few happy billionaires, very few happy people with that kind of wealth. They worked, they worked super hard. Many of them were lucky and worked hard and made buckets of money, but the buckets of money have not bought them happiness. Mm -hmm. And the secret is to learn how to serve others in a really meaningful way. And, and that doesn't mean doing a Mother Teresa kind of thing. I mean, just like what we do, Prison of Peace started off really small, still pretty small, really. We hope it'll get a lot bigger, but just who would ever think about walking into a maximum security prison and teaching a gangbanger how to be a peacemaker? Yeah. Just the opportunities are out there. And if you if you follow your heart rather than you, your bank account, you'll do fine. And the universe will provide. Now, that was a really hard lesson for me to learn, but I found it. And I can't tell you how happy I am. My life is amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Get up in the morning, watch the sun come up over the mountain, sitting in the hot tub, you know, throwing the Frisbee for the dog. <laughs> down, <laughs> down I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. Well, and normally I ask, do you have an advice that you want to share? But it's kind of feel like that was. A the advice is to really, you know, I know when you're young, there's a really interesting book called Falling Upward Now, I think that by uh, Richard Rohr. And he talks about how the first ha half of life is all about accumulation. And the second half of life is all about giving. And I think that's really true. I think that's really true. And so, so especially for people who are in career or mid-career, you've got bills to pay, you've got kids to raise, you've got college tuition to pay someday, you know, you're trying to make it, make it go, you're trying to advance in your career, recognize that that's just a, it's just a phase in your life and it's, it's going to be over with and you'll be moving into other phases. So as much as you can try to serve other people, whether it's your family or if you're in a faith community in your faith community or whatever it is, try to try to find something that gives you meaning and satisfaction. And it's, if, it, if you can combine that with your work, that's even better because just grinding for the dollar is it's soulless work for the most part. And, you know, that's why so many people are unhappy and drink too much and, you know, trying to escape the pain of their lives. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. My next set of questions is called the fun five. And this right. is just questions <laughs> I ask everybody. So we'll get to this one, but, but yeah, this has been a really meaningful chat. So thank you for this so far. So what's the oldest t-shirt you have and still wear? I have a t-shirt that is over 30 years old. Amazing. Probably almost probably 35 years. I have three or four of them. They're from my martial arts training. Mm. And you know, they're just t-shirts and I wore them when I was training, but I haven't trained in that stuff in a long time. And so they just, they're just sitting on the shelf. I'm thinking, wow, I've had this t-shirt since 1986. <laughs> and it doesn't have a hole in it. <laughs> you know, it's still a pretty good t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, it's kind of things back then lasted a long time. Now yeah. they almost come, they come with holes in them a lot of the time. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand that. <laughs> that. I guess that dates me. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay for me too. I mean, it's tough for me. All right. So if every day was really Groundhog's Day, like it seemed for a while, mm -hmm. it's a little bit better now. What song would you have your alarm clock set to play every morning? 
hearing the same song over and over again. I, I'd probably do Dave Brubeck's Take Five because okay. it's so rep, you know, it's a five, it's a four, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, you know, like that. So it's mm -hmm. very repetitive rhythmically. And that would be a great Groundhog Day sound. All right. Coffee or tea or neither? I'm a coffee drinker, although I'm now off caffeine. So it's decaf. Mm -hmm. And we have an espresso machine that makes this amazing. It's a Jura espresso machine. So we get to get, we, I have three or four shots of decaf espresso every morning and that's it for my coffee. I used to be a real caffeine addict, but I've been diagnosed as, as high risk for glaucoma. So the first thing I, you got to do is get off caffeine. Oh, interesting. So, so got to change. I live a very healthy life, but yeah. I'm just looking at what are the, what are the things I can eat and drink that'll protect my eyes. And so huh. caffeine I said, okay, let's go to decaf. And it, it turns out it's, it works for me fine. Okay. Can you think of something that just makes you like laugh so hard you cry or just cracks you up when you think of it? I just like to know what makes people tick in this way, really. What really cracks me up is I've got an eight-month-old Border Collie female puppy. And watching her grow up and go out and do the crazy stuff she does, Border Collies are insane dogs. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they're just, they're just, I've had a lot of dogs in my life, but I've never had a Border Collie, and they are insane. And she <laughs> so fun to watch she's she's cracks me up she can be the sweetest little puppy and just kind of look at you and her ears are back and she's just being real sweet and then then she can go like this you know get really yeah. focused, really intense because you got a disc in her hand right so she's a disc addict and you throw that disc out 25 or 30 yards down the hill and she gets down she's like six inches off the ground blasting down the hillside like totally focused and she gets to it and it zigs a little bit and she zigs and then she's up in the air, grabs it and pulls it down. And then she puffs up her tails up and she's so proud of herself because she got the disc. It is <laughs> hysterical to watch. <laughs> That's Every good. morning I get to watch. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. She sounds like a character. All right. Oh, she's and something that's nice though. Cause I mean, sometimes people get a dog and they're like, Oh, why did I get this dog? So <laughs> I'm glad you're, <laughs> you're excited you're about yours. So the last question, who inspires you right now? You know, the sad thing is that I stay atop current events and current, current events mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And, and I don't see anybody out there who is truly, truly inspiring and is really moving the needle. I see a lot of people that talk a lot and are in some ways inspirational for who they are, like the Dalai Lama. But but the people that inspire me are people who are actually out there doing things and making change happen. So I can't think of anybody right now that truly inspires me, although I'm sure there are people out there that are doing really inspiring work. But my, my criteria for an inspiring person is somebody who's actually effectuating change, not somebody who's out there preaching or lecturing or talking or you know, is has an image, but somebody's actually working in the trenches, making stuff happen. Yeah. You know, maybe maybe as I think about that, maybe Volodymyr Zelensky, president of Ukraine, has inspired me because of his courage. And here's a guy who was look, looked at as an idiot six months ago. And today he's a national hero and a world icon for standing yes. up to the Russians. And he's a guy who's effectuating change as a leader. And the other thing that's really interesting is that as a leader, he's demonstrating that the leaders don't do, leaders lead. You know, he's not out there fighting, although he's, you know, doing, making lots of decisions. And that's mm -hmm. something that I think that's something that's, you know, something we can all learn from. So if you're looking for inspiring people, look for people who are really instigating change in the world in a positive way and not just, not just talking about it. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's it's hard because... A lot of people do just talk and, and the people who spend the most time telling you about what they did to me usually aren't doing very much because they have so much time to tell you about it. People are very self-promotional. Yeah. So I, you know, I, you know, the people that really are really trying to do things mm -hmm. are the people who are really inspirational. I heard somebody, one of my graduate students sent me a YouTube video today of a pastor in Georgia who got up in front of the Georgia legislature and said, you know, we got to stop this tribalism. How can we make Georgia the greatest state in the world? We can do it by stopping the tribalism, mm -hmm. you know, by stopping this talk about Democrats being socialist, communists, and Republicans being white supremacist, racist. You know, we got to stop that. Move to the middle. The hard thing to do right now is to move to the middle. 
Move to the messy middle. That's where stuff gets done. That's where we can make change. And I thought his message was really profound. Uh, move, to the, move to the messy middle politically. There's no yeah. money there. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to fund that because it's messy. But that's where we have to be. We have to be in the messy middle. Mm-hmm. Well, that's where the compromise will take place. So, okay, cool. Well, thank you for that. And then, and yeah, it sometimes becomes a hard question for some people. And I, I can see why it is for you. And then as far as just people, if they want to find you, Doug, or if they want to find Prisons of Peace, where should they go? So I created a special page on my website for everybody who is listening right now. And if you go there, four offerings, one free ebook about talking about my de-escalation skills. Two, you can buy my fourth book, De-Escalate, How to Calm an Angry Person in 90 Seconds or Less. You can also get access to my video course, How to, how to Calm an Angry Person in 90 Seconds or Less video course. And then if you really want to invest in yourself, you can enroll in the um, emotional competency courses, which teaches you, basically teaches you how to be emotionally competent. And, and which opens up your life in many ways. If you want to learn about the Prison of Peace Project, go to prisonofpeace.org. And that, that's our project website. It's not totally up to date, but it'll give you a good sense of, of what the project is up to. And if you're interested in maybe starting Prison of Peace and we're in your neck of the woods, you've got a jail or a prisoner or a reentry program or a domestic abuse shelter, uh, then reach out to me at Doug at DougNoll.com and we can open up a conversation about how to make that happen. Super. All right. Well, Doug, thanks so much for being on More Than Work. And I really appreciate the chat. It was it was fun, but it was also like super informative. And I, I really appreciate what you're doing. Well, you're welcome. It was great being here. Thanks for listening. You can learn more about the guest and what was talked about in the show notes. Joe Mafia created the music you're listening to. You can find him on Spotify at Joe, M-A-F-F-I-A. Rob Metke does all the design, for which I am so grateful. You can find him online by searching Rob, M-E-T-K-E. Please leave a review if you like the show and get in touch if you have feedback or guest ideas. The pod is on all the social channels at, at More Than Work Pod or at Robbie Comedy on TikTok. And the website is morethanworkpod.com. While being kind to others, don't forget to be kind to yourself.